Good afternoon, Facebook. My name is Chuck Fagan, and this is a special presentation of the Better Fa uh, Savannah Facebook page. Better Savannah is the area's leading independent expenditure committee focused on progressive policy outcomes here at the local level. This weekend, we're interviewing candidates for the open Democratic primary for House District 163. We've interviewed three candidates thus far, and this afternoon, we're joined by Derek Malo, our fourth candidate to interview. Uh, we'll get to his introduction in, in just a second. Um, but again, I want to just remind everybody that this is Better Savannah's Facebook page. Please like this page, share this stream uh, wherever you may be watching to groups of people that are in this district or in the Chatham County area that care about the future. Uh, with that, I want to get to our guest, Mr. Derek Malo. Appreciate you sitting down uh, to interview with us. I know it's been a crazy uh, few weeks, few months with everything that is going on. Tell uh, our viewers, our audience, a little bit about yourself, why you're running for House District 163, uh, and uh, go from there. Well, hello, and first and foremost, Chuck, and to you and the entire team at Better Savannah, thank you for having me on this forum. Thank you for inviting me and taking the time out and allowing me the opportunity to, to be here today. Uh, my name is Derek Mallow. I am a native of Savannah. I'm a, I'm a product of the Savannah and Chatham County Public School System. Uh, and uh, on today, I graduated virtually with a master's in public administration and a graduate certificate in nonprofit organization and leadership. Uh, I'm also a treasurer of the 100 Black Men of Savannah. I also serve as treasurer of the Tall Beta Sigma chapter of Phi Beta Sigma. Uh, I've been a lifelong employee and uh, participant in the Boy Scouts of America. I've served uh, the Coastal Georgia Council and the Boy Scouts of America as a whole for the last 13 years. Uh, in the nonprofit sector. So my life has been uh, doing what was done for me and that's giving back. Uh, Muhammad Ali said it best. He said, service to others is the rent we have to pay to be here on earth. And so the rent that I've been paying uh, the last 13 years have been giving back to those who helped me. Uh, and I'm most appreciative of working with the young people of Savannah for the time that I have. And I also serve as executive minister of First Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, and I oversee a, a, a significant portion of our operations there. Uh, at First Tabernacle, located also in the district. And so um, that's my background and who I am. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I want to start with what's on everybody's mind this last week, uh, both locally here in uh, Savannah, but really around the country. Uh, and I'm talking about the, the death of Ahmaud Arbery, the video that surfaced, uh, the subsequent case being handed over to the GBI. Uh, within 24 hours arresting uh, the two men uh, allegedly uh, who killed uh, Ahmad Arbery. I want uh, your take on, on, on these type of events that's very close to home. Uh, you obviously are very passionate about the issue, uh, as we all should be. Uh, give us your take on what happened and, and what the legislature should do in response. Absolutely, Chuck. Thank you for that question. Uh, and uh, to the cowards who uh, gunned down Ahmad Aubrey. Um, you are spineless individuals who took the life of a young man uh, and what I would consider to be a modern day lynching. The young man had no choice to have a flight. His only mechanism was to fight and he had to fight individuals who were mounted uh, on the back of a pickup truck, uh, seeking only to put him down like you would something worse than an animal. Uh, he was shot down in the streets. Animals get better treatment than Ahmaud Aubrey got, and I think it was their intent to murder him. Uh, the video is clear, and uh, those individuals uh, have a special place in, in hell for their actions. Uh, my thoughts go out to uh, Ahmaud's mother to celebrate Mother's Day, only to know that her son will be dead on Mother's Day. And so my condolences are to the Aubrey family uh, and all those who are victims of <laughs> such a racist gesture. Uh, to those individuals, um, what I look at, when I look at the, the case of Ahmaud Arbery is what I feel happens to African-Americans each and every day, uh, Chuck. I feel like uh, their cases are oftentimes swept under the rug. And I think if it had not been for the attorney trying to help his friends get off with this, that video would not have seen the light of day and that video has single-handedly been a difference maker, I think, in why law enforcement has engaged but I also think that we have to look at the scales of justice. Uh, the scales of justice, when you look at uh, the police department from its inception, 
has been um, very racist in its uh, creation in order to help patrol and corral African Americans. And so what you find is a person who used his position in law enforcement to help convince others that he should not be prosecuted. And in fact, what's coming out today suggests that uh, he had help from the district attorney. Um, the report I read today said that officers wanted to make an arrest and the district attorney told them not to. So the top cop in Glenn County was conspiring to help bury this case uh, and deny justice for this family, which is a travesty because a threat to justice in Brunswick uh, is a threat to justice everywhere. And that small piece of injustice is a very serious threat to all of our liberties and rights. But more importantly, uh, it sent a sobering reminder that if you're African-American, uh, we need body cams because without the footage, uh, they would have labeled him everything but a child of God. And I think that's important to understand being an African-American and having to deal with an instance like that uh, if it wasn't for the video, his case might not have seen the light of day, he, light of day and he might have been just another name, another name that has had their innocent blood spilled in the streets, another name that nobody would know, a name that wouldn't even go uh, to be recognized if it had not been for national news attention. He would have died a nameless black boy murdered in the streets and his so-called vigilantes who thought that they were taking justice in their hands or nothing more than a modern day lynch mob seeking to kill that young man. And every intent was to kill him. They didn't go to make a citizen's arrest. If it was a citizen's arrest, I didn't hear in the video where they said, stop, get on the ground, police are on the way. They shot him, they shot him and they shot him again. And the individual in the video cocks his gun. So the intent was to kill him, not to subdue him. And I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about that Chuck. So I'm gonna have to stop right there because I'm getting enraged all over again. Yeah. I understand. I understand. I, I, we're going to have the district attorney candidates on next week, but I want to I, I want to ask you, what should the legislature do in response? We're one of a few states that doesn't have a hate crime law. Uh, what should the legislature be doing? The, the legislature needs to create and pass uh, a, a hate crime bill. Uh, there is no hate crime legislation in the state of Georgia. The GBI director confirmed that for us. And we need the immediate passage of legislation to protect uh, people of color from hate crimes and to have those hate crimes as soon as they are committed. Uh, local law enforcement should have some form of a deterrent uh, by reporting those crimes. And it should be a serious enough penalty that if they don't, they would want to uh, basically make sure that information is done. I think the legislature should also appoint a special prosecutor in this case and in all cases of a hate crime and that the GBI should immediately handle the investigation. Uh, this case has shown us that local elected officials and local law enforcement simply cannot be trusted to uncover and uh, present the, the matters of truth in this case. In fact, this case has gone from not one, but two, but three district attorneys. Uh, I think every case needs to have the uh, full resources of the Attorney General's Office and that of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to an, investigate this crime without um, any bias and to be fully uh, impartial and come out with, with the truth. And so not only do we need hate crime legislation, but we also need a special prosecutor to be appointed to handle the case. And we also need the GBI to handle the investigative uh, arm of the case as well and not put our hands in local law enforcement. Uh, not to say that our local law enforcement officials uh, in every county are bad, uh, but what I'm saying is that we need to just make sure we have the best and brightest uh, at the GBI handling these type of cases with the special prosecutors whose sole job is to make sure that families and the victims of hate crime, whether they be African-American, but that they get justice. Uh, because we know that hate crimes are, are more than just uh, African-Americans being targeted and murdered, but uh, they do in include other minorities and other protected classes as well. Absolutely, I appreciate your responses. Moving a little bit more you know, uh, away from the case, obviously it's fresh on everybody's minds when an injustice like that occurs so close to home. Um, so the city of Savannah, along with the city of Atlanta and Clarkston, uh, decriminalized the possession of marijuana uh, of less than one ounce. Uh, do you think it's past time for the state uh, to at least do that, of decriminalized possession of simple marijuana, uh, low an ounce? Absolutely, because the jails are filled with uh, minorities and predominantly African-Americans. Uh, and we're in there for, for nonviolent offenses, most likely uh, drug charges. Uh, and as it relates to the recreational use of marijuana, we've seen that if you uh, take people and remove them from incarcerating them for small, 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 small drug crimes, 
uh, that less than an ounce is not something that would be dramatically um, killing our community or our economy at all. In fact, I think those people are oftentimes put into a worse position by incarcerating those individuals for nonviolent drug offenses. And then it goes a step further. It's not just the nonviolent drug offense that incarcerates them. Then they're required to post a cash bail sometimes to get out of jail. And so now if these individuals are in poverty, we we um, further perpetuate the cycle of poverty by having individuals uh, be arrested for a small nonviolent crime, a petty drug crime, have to post a bond to get out of jail, then to appear in court and hopefully hire an attorney to represent them. Because we know the public defender's office is overloaded, their resources have been cut. And so uh, what do we do? Uh, those tactics are the failed war on drugs that hadn't worked in the last uh, 40 years. That's what that is. I appreciate that. Let's talk a little bit more about poverty. Chatham County's poverty rate is 17.3%. As you know, the city's is far more than that, usually 24 to 27%. Uh, and, that's, and, and that's a poverty level that was created in 1964. So it's really not even relevant uh, to today's standards. Uh, but given the effects of the coronavirus already, the economic shutdowns, I think we can all expect that these rates are only going to increase in 2021 and 2022. What steps as a delegation member are you going to take uh, to, to, to fight against uh, the rise in poverty because of this crisis? What's the role of the government in fighting poverty? Well, so the role of the government in fighting poverty is to create opportunities and avenues for folks to uh, have a, uh, a better, so to speak, economic shakeup to get out of poverty. So we do job fairs, right, in the city of Savannah. We do job fairs, but I have not one time seen a contract fair. How can we increase the amount of minority owned businesses, create more minority owned businesses, disadvantaged businesses and women businesses to go after local and state contracts? When have we had a contract fair to show minority businesses how to navigate this process? How can we change poverty when we don't even give the people an opportunity to pull a chair up to the table? So we're going to have to look at policies that will be reflective to increase minority business participation, as well as disadvantaged business enterprises uh, to have an opportunity to know how to navigate that contract process, know how to fill out that process. Because one of the ways to pull people out of poverty is to create opportunities and pathways for them that are not uh, something that you would normally know about. And so maybe that's creation of more small businesses. We know small business is the lifeline in Georgia. So we're going to have to create more business owners. We're going to have to put avenues and resources out there for people to take their talents and to monetize those talents so that they can make a way of life for themselves, their families, and future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, unemployment rates were already historically low, but even within those unemployment rates, there were large disparities amongst women people of color and other minorities, the crisis is only expected to expand these uh, types of disparities. After the last recession, it took 75 months for pre-recessionary employment levels to come back. You know, given the depth of the current economic downturn and that your district specifically is disproportionately represented of low wage jobs in the hospitality and tourism industry, you know, how can you assure voters that the least among us are not gonna be forgotten through this crisis and the extended recovery. Are you prepared to extend unemployment benefits uh, through the remainder of this crisis, no matter the cost to the state of Georgia? I think uh, through this crisis, we have an opportunity for individuals whose companies have laid them off um, under the promise, a promise made should be a promise kept, point blank and simple. And if individuals are expecting to receive that unemployment insurance, uh, that unemployment payment that they've uh, receive, so to speak. Uh, we should continue that. Uh, and absolutely, when you look at the cost to the state, what is the cost to the state? Well, companies have made uh, millions and billions of dollars in the state of Georgia, but they've not taken care of their workforce, especially in the service industry. You look at tourism as a booming industry in Savannah, but the workers are the lowest paid. So surely somebody got paid, just wasn't the workers. So we have an opportunity and we have a commitment to make sure that those people receive the benefits that was promised to them. Now to answer, thank you, thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. Another part of your question, Chuck. You said, "How can we make sure that we don't forget the least of these in the district?" Because this district is made mm -hmm. up uh, of of individuals. I think it is simply put that in order to advance these individuals and to bring them up, uh, there's going to be an opportunity to retrain and provide reskills. If you remember the recession in 2008. Uh, President Obama came out with uh, some initiatives through the Department of Labor to help folks retrain and go back to school, get a different skill. 
Uh, and so I think uh, as trades are booming, uh, we may want to look at how we can create small businesses through trades. Um, because while there's a recession, HBAC, uh, plumbing, those type of industries are not going to be out of business, but maybe we need to shift, um, so to speak, our, our, our skills and our resources to a different avenue. Thank you. Thank you for, for that answer. Sticking on this same topic, you know, it, 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 the Republicans across the South, specifically here in Georgia, uh, have uh, put a lot of work requirements on safety net programs like Medicaid, uh, temporary assistance for needy families, uh, different types of welfare programs that are designed to help people at the bottom. Uh, how can there be work requirements on some of these programs when 36 million people are out of work? And specifically, I want to ask you, will you raise or support to raise the eligibility ceiling uh, of temporary assistance uh, for needy families above 100% of the federal poverty line? I think the federal poverty line for a family of four is still $25,000. I think you and I both know it's not going to go very far for four people in Savannah. Uh, absolutely. And, and let me, let me just, uh, my, my life is intertwined in my policies. So uh, when I was a young boy, I remember my grandmother who worked for less than five fifteen an hour. Now uh, let's also go back and also understand that the state of Georgia doesn't have uh, of a standard that adopted the federal minimum wage. The minimum wage in the state of Georgia is still 515. On the books, it's still 515. And so uh, when we look at how we can um, move past raising that eligibility level, 100% support that because as I gave my grandmother's an example, she made less than 515. I remember her reading the letter from the Department of Family and Children's Services and said she didn't qualify for food stamps. Now, my grandmother's making less than 515 back then. You could imagine, I looked at one of her pay stubs, it was $3.85, okay? $3.85. So how could she make it on $3.85 in the early 90s, 2000s, um, and she couldn't qualify for uh, food stamps? She couldn't qualify for any assistance. And I think that is one of the reasons people are falling further in the tra trajectory of poverty is because as soon as they get one ounce or one inch closer to getting out of poverty, the system that we've created says, up, oh, you're too close. It's like the young man with the dollar. Oh, I got you now, don't I? And you reach for the dollar. Oh, don't you think I got you? And that's how I feel government has done. We should string it along uh, the entire time. And I think we should raise it above 100%. Uh, we should also look at how we can create other programs to help move people uh, in the in, that are in poverty to a place where they can understand and move themselves to getting to a baseline and helping them achieve and set goals. I think that's very important in this process. Not tell them, oh, you're making just a little too much, but how can we really help them um, realistic financial financially plan to move their lives forward? Thank you, thank you. I do just wanna follow up and ask you again, will you, will you support raising the eligibility cap for temporary assistance for needy families fundings beyond the 100% of the federal poverty line during this crisis because of uh, many people being out of work? Um, I, I do wanna support it. Uh, and also at the same time of supporting it, I also want to uh, look at the, the number of individuals because now, in saying, yes, I want to support it, but how does that also go back into the state budget crisis? What if we don't have the money to do it? Uh, how do we find the money to do it? I'm also committed to working to say, okay, let's come out with a realistic solution to see what we can do, because if the money's not there, what do we do? Um, I don't want to make a promise and say I'm 100% behind and then if the money's not there, I can't do it. Um, but I want to work to see what we can do. I think we absolutely should do it, especially in this time of crisis uh, with unemployment going through the roof. Absolutely, but also can we find the money on the back end of the state budget to be able to support it? Well, we'll talk a little bit more about the state budget uh, in just a bit. Keeping up with in the, in the poverty uh, area, the, you know, the ultimate solution to poverty is, is not just a job, but a good job, a well-paying job with a high wage. Uh, the county and the city of Savannah appoints two thirds of the Savannah Economic Development Authority. Now, now CETA is a state chartered authority uh, it's, it's objective is to attract new businesses and jobs to the area. They do this by, uh, representing the local governments in terms of giving away property tax abatements. Uh, these deals that are put together, Derek, are, are ever audited later on to determine how many jobs are actually created. And most importantly, what were the wages of those jobs? Um, I think we both agree Savannah's economy is pretty regional at this point in time. Um, particularly with the logistics corridors. Do you think that the authority should be updated 
to represent that, uh, meaning that maybe the last third of the board members should be appointed by a rotating smaller municipality in Chatham County rather than the board itself. And ultimately, will you support auditing, you know, those contracts that CETA puts in place for tax abatements in exchange for job creation? Uh, so let me answer the last question first, and uh, I'll let you repeat the first question to me to make sure I answered appropriately. Uh, I do support auditing um, because if, if in any authority, no matter who you are, we should always be open to the inspection um, of what's being done. I was once told when I started my career in nonprofit, you cannot expect what you do not inspect. And so for expectation, there should also come inspection. And so I support that. I mean, every charity and nonprofit has to go through an annual uh, review of, of their financials and their accounting done in the form of an audit. So I support an audit in those regards to make sure that uh, the things that were promised were things that were done, but that audit should not necessarily put CETA to the gun because what if there was some promise that they said they were gonna try to bring an employee in and they, they weren't able to do it? Um, that should necessarily hold them accountable, responsible because the employer fell through. That's not realistic uh, goal setting. So I think it should be based on, you know, what has actually happened uh, what did they give away so we can then see what the return was to uh, the citizens uh, of Savannah House District 163 and the broader Chatham County area? Thank you. The other question along CETA's lines was the makeup of its board, the current charter, which again, the delegation controls uh, by home rule. Uh, the current charter allows for the Chatham County government to have one third of the appointments the city of Savannah to have the second third of appointments, but then the board itself appoints the last third of its members uh, to, to that board of directors. Do you think that that ought to be changed, that charter ought to be updated to reflect a regional economy and maybe rotate that last third of board appointments to smaller municipalities like Pooler, Garden City, Port Wentworth? Bloomingdale. Sure. Oh, I, I wasn't going to name all of them. I was just naming a few. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I think we definitely could look at that um, because I think uh, as it's the Savannah Economic Development Authority, right? That's that's what its term is. And, and it's representing more than just Savannah. It's actually representing all of Chatham County. Um, I do think um, each of the municipalities should have a seat at the table. Um, now, I'm 100% not sure exactly where the lion's share of, of all their funding may be coming from. Um, but I do think there should be equal representation among the municipalities and the county delegation. Uh, as it comes to a maybe a rotating process, um, I would like to see uh, more of an inclusionary process where each municipality had a seat at the table because I think one of the uh, dis, uh, efficiencies we have is that government does not necessarily work together. Uh, so I think as each municipality is running their own city, I think they should have representation to the table as well, not just Savannah, so that the broader perspective could be uh, brought together versus maybe rotating it off because we don't know where the best, best and brightest talent may be. It may be in Pooler, it may be in Garden City, it may be in Port Wentworth, it may be in Bloomingdale, but if we're all at the table together, uh, we can come up with a, an adequate solution to the challenges of the economy and our economics as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. I want to move on and talk a little bit about education. Uh, the last Republican governor attempted a statewide takeover of schools known as the Opportunity School Districts. Your predecessor, your potential predecessor, uh, was one of only a dozen Democrats in the state to support the bill. If the state is going to single out failing schools one by one, district by district, shouldn't they be offering additional funding to fix these broken schools rather than taking them over with the intent of shutting them down? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and the schools who uh, are, you know, with opportunity in, in turnaround schools are the schools who need the most resources. Um, and, you know, I, I've heard many people talk about the QBE, the quality basic, basic education formula and what that looks like. But I think uh, the state should create an opportunity weight uh, within that QBE formula so that students who are in impoverished uh, schools and impoverished communities have additional resources available to help them succeed. Uh, because we know that when you have wraparound services at a school, um, the kids tend to perform and do better because all of their essential services and needs are being able to be identified, addressed, and we're able to uh, solve those challenges. So I don't necessarily think the state can come in and take over a school and they know how to run it better than the people locally. Um, absolutely, I can be the best fisherman in Savannah, 
but if I don't have the right equipment to fish with, surely the state coming in to hand me the same fishing pole and they got a bigger tackle box because they got all the tools and resources. Of course they can get more fish than I can because they have all the tools and resources. I think in order for our local uh, school system to do better, we have to give them all the tools and the resources that we have. Uh, and that means giving every kid a chance, point blank simple. Thank you, thank you. You mentioned wraparound services. I think that's a great point and topic to talk about right now. What, uh, without thinking about the funding yet, we'll, we'll get to the funding sides of the equations. What should the state be mandating in terms of wraparound services? You know, what types of things should be offered in the schools that are suffering the most, uh, which there are several, you know, here in the district in 163? Um, when, when we look at wraparound services, um, to be honest, I think, again, the, the problem has been the state has created the mandates. Um, that, that's essentially the problem. The state creates the mandates. Uh, how do we demand when we don't have the conversation with our local school board to find out what they need? That, that can't be a, a statement that I tell you that they need. I, I don't know what every school needs. Um, we know that there's wraparound services needed. We know that there's uh, IEPs that need to be addressed. We know that there's uh, needs with school counselors. We know that you know clinical needs, mental health needs need to be met with children and we need to create more opportunities and avenues so that they can receive and get those services. Um, but I can't tell you what a state mandate should be without talking and considering with those local principals what that looks like. Too often we write prescriptions at the state level and expect the local government, our local patient to take that and hopefully that'll cure their problem. You can't take the state government and ask state government to write you a big prescription to solve your local problem without even consulting with you about what the problem is. I think we need to spend more time creating roundtable discussions to find out what schools need, what those wraparound services needs to look like and how the state can help our local our local school board achieve those goals. Uh, too often we come out, you know, when I work with educators, all you hear is the word go this, go that, go this, go that. Um, the Georgia Department of Education is Godot, and they're like Big Brother, and Big Brother tells you what to do, but Big Brother doesn't know your kids, they don't know your teachers, they don't know what these kids wake up with and struggle with every day, they don't know their home life, they don't know what the heck is going on. And so we got to stop coming out with these big prescriptions and let our local school board members and our local principals and teachers tell us what they need, and then we, the delegation, should go fight to get them what they need. I think you made some great points there uh, about Goodell. I think there's a similar relationship. I've heard the term 208 Bull Street a lot, right? Uh, and that, of course, is referring to the headquarters of the Savannah, uh, Tatum County uh, public school system. Um, do you think there's an imbalance to how much administration costs for public schools? Do you think the legislature should do something to rein in the costs of administering the K-12 school system in Georgia? Uh, I, I definitely think we should take a look at what it costs to uh, pay administration in schools and to make sure that we conduct some uh, compensation and equity study to make sure uh, the salaries are on par with what they should be uh, versus, you know, somebody just deciding to give somebody a big salary because they think that's what the opportunity should be. And we should also look at our administration to make sure there's not redundancy or duplication of services provided by administrators. I know that the school district went through a compensation study um, a couple years ago, and it was staggering to find out that uh, women were paid less than their male counterparts in the Chatham County public school system. So I think we just need to look at that. We need to look and see how those positions are deemed and how they're essential and if there's any duplication of services and look at ways to streamline as we know we're going to have to do more with less in this upcoming budget cycle. And so that may call for some vacant positions not to be filled. Uh, some would say, well, if we don't fill the position, we're not going to be as efficient. But uh, oftentimes, this is what we have to do in nonprofits in corporate America uh, each and every day. Uh, sometimes we just have to sometimes make it work. And our educators have been making it work in the schools for a very long time. I would be first to say that. Thank you. Thank you. I want to first congratulate you on gradu graduating with your master's degree uh, and then ask you this question about higher education. The University System of Georgia is bracing for unprecedented cuts. Uh, this is just a decade after the last round of cuts from the Great Recession. Uh, last time, a decade ago, we, we lost the Hope Scholarship as we knew it, and the resulting cuts uh, resulted in several mergers, including right here in District 163 with the merger of Armstrong and Georgia Southern. What are your thoughts on the future of higher education in Georgia, and you know how can the system brace for these cuts and still provide 
a quality higher education? Well, we know, um, you know, some agencies practice incremental budgeting. Uh, incremental budgeting is just where they look at the previous budget, they may add 5%, take away 5%. Uh, but in a time where you're going to have exponential uh, revenue shortfalls, I think we're going to have to look at uh, zero based budgeting, uh, where every department uh, builds their budget from the ground up and defends every expenditure that they need in that budget. Um, that will help reduce waste and cut out some of the overhead things that happen uh, in the higher education system. Um, if we said that there was no waste, there's waste in everything. And one of the ways to ensure that we're providing every service to students is to make sure we first make sure there, there's no waste. All dollars are justified. Uh, when we get that, we should then move forward to looking at uh, what are essential? Uh, what things do we have to have? Uh, in order to make sure that the universities can operate. Um, and if that's the same thing, are, are there vacancies uh, in staffing that we may look at not necessarily filling in this period of this time frame, uh, so that services to students aren't necessarily cut, but we can look at, okay, are we doing all that we can to brace for the shortfall? Because they, if the money is not there, there's simply not more than we can, we can, we can do with that, so to speak. If, if there's not revenue, we, we can't have more expenses than we do revenue. Revenue That means we're operating in a deficiency. We just can't operate in that manner. Uh, so we're just gonna have to look at everything and look at every expense and ask ourselves the question, do we really need this? Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Speaking of, of questioning whether we need things, uh, one item that's in the proposed fiscal year 2021 budget uh, is a, a $210 million bond package over three years to expand the Hutchinson Island Trade Center. You know, given our experience with the tourism industry and the low wage jobs it produces, and given everything that you know right now about the pandemic and its likely impact on culture and tourism and events, do you think that's a wise use of resources for the public's money in, in, in a bond package spending over three years? Uh, do you think we should be expanding a tourism project uh, during a downturn in an economy like this? Uh, no, I, I don't think we should expand tourism in a downturn of the economy. I think that project should be put on hold. Um, I do think it adds value if tourism was bolstering and we weren't in uh, a pandemic almost to the, the brink of what could be considered an economic recession with budget shortfalls coming in 2021 and shortly thereafter. And I also think the city of Savannah should look at putting the arena project on hold as well. Um, I don't think an investment in tourism at this moment in time is the best juncture until we can fully grasp the pulse of how tourism and how our economy is going to rebound uh, from COVID-19. I think until we can put our finger on the pulse and detect how the heart is beating, uh, we shouldn't uh, move in any direction uh, too fast or too hasty. So to invest resources into a building that may not generate uh, the expected outcomes and revenue that we hope that it can do. And again, uh, if, uh, hopes and wishes with candy and nuts, it'd be Christmas every day. I got to tell you, you know, it's refreshing to hear uh, a very decisive answer on, on not only the state level issue of something you're running for, but also something in the city. Better Savannah has long opposed the arena, uh, not because we don't want economic investment in the West Side, um, but, but because, you know, we just don't see the value in investing in a sector uh, that the jobs have been historically low wage, non-unionized, not a lot of benefits. Um, and certainly given the pandemic crisis where, you know, I don't think you nor I are, are, are ready to go to a Falcons game anytime soon. Uh, I, I don't think they will be playing this year. We'll be lucky if they play this year. That's probably a better way to say it. You know, I just don't think it's the wisest use of resources when budgets are going to be so constrained over the next two fiscal years, as you indicated. So just want to tell you, I really appreciate uh, that response. Uh, well, you know, you've worked in the nonprofit uh, administrative world uh, for the last 15 years, I believe, uh, or, or longer even. Um, you know, if, if you win this position, if you win this election, will you continue working in that field? Uh, you know, or, you know, this is a part-time role, obviously, even though it will not seem that way. Uh, I'm sure Craig will tell you if you speak with him that uh, the pay is not glamorous. Um, you're not really in it for the pay, I assume. What are you going to do besides uh, being a state rep while you're uh, while you're in office? I plan to continue serving uh, the Boy Scouts of America and my community as a whole through the Boy Scouts of America. Uh, basically, you know, if I'm out legislating, um, I would ask you know the Boy Scouts to pause my salary from them. 
while I'm in session. And when I return, uh, I'll be a full-time employee with the Boy Scouts and, you know, working and advocating for my district as well, uh, always being accessible by phone and email and that sort of thing. But uh, I hope to continue my role to advance the mission to create more opportunities for our young people throughout Savannah. Thank you. Thank you. You know, something that's come up a lot recently uh, is, uh, is the role of lobbyists for the city and county governments. Uh, members of our local delegation have said they've never spoken to these lobbyists. Um, what should the role of a lobbyist, what should the relationship of a local lobbyist for a city or ch county government be with the delegation? Man, they should be the right hand. Um, remember, you know, our delegation is just few votes in both the, the, the rep House, of Represent House of Representatives and the, the Senate. And so uh, the lobbyists should be working hand in hand with the delegation to help advance the needs of Savannah Chatham County. Uh, they should be helping us to work across the aisle, to work with other legislators to help advance the economic needs in Savannah. That's their role is to lobby, to help us pass legislation. If we create and craft the message we know what Savannah needs, they got to help us work to get it passed. Uh, the delegation is but few votes of many needed to pass legislation. And if we don't know who our lobbyists are, we're not talking to our lobbyists. I asked the question, why are we paying them? We just said we got to work on an economic downturn. If we're paying somebody and they're not working for us, then the question is, why are we paying them? Because they're not working. Sure. Thank you. You know, I think uh, I want to talk about SPLOS legislation next. And, and that's why I asked about the lobbyists is that, you know, there's a lot of latitude that the delegation has for what's called home rule, right? For, for legislation that's just going to affect uh, you know, some of the things here locally. SPLOS, unfortunately, is going to require potentially some statewide amendments. SPLOS, of course, is the special purpose local option sales tax. Uh, it's used for capital projects uh, like the arena. Uh, it's probably the single largest source of reserves uh, for, for city or municipal governments uh, outside, uh, outside of maybe their pensions uh, systems. Uh, you know, do you envision changes needed for this BLAS legislation at the statewide level, uh, what ideas do you have uh, to change SPLOS? Uh, thank you for the question, Chuck. As it relates to SPLOS, I think um, one of the things looking at an economic downturn uh, with money sitting in SPLOS reserves, uh, I think we should look at ways to allow our local and municipal governments to repurpose those SPLOS funds if there is budget shortfalls due to COVID-19. I think to say if we did collect those monies under the pretense of accomplishing this specific project, we have to be realistic about that. Uh, do we allow our workforce uh, for city and local government to be laid off and furloughed because the city does not have enough revenue from property taxes or sales tax coming in to sustain? Or should we allow a uh, special option and pass legislation where they can look at how to use those SPLOS funds to fund essential services like sanitation, police, fire and those sort of uh, public safety measures as well. And I think local government should be trusted enough that they will do the right thing by the citizens and using those SPLOS funds uh, for that specific purpose. And I think there needs to be uh, some legislation passed to give local governments the power to do so. Uh, again, the state can't tell the city of Savannah or Bloomingdale or Chatham County what their specific city needs. Uh, the, the state is operating uh, for every county in Georgia. I can't exactly say that's why they've elected a local mayor and alder woman and men to represent them because they know what they need. So I think we should look at that and give government an opportunity to decide on how they want to use those funds. Do you think, I want to I appreciate that answer, uh, Derek. Do you, do you think that the Georgia Ports Authority and the Port of Savannah should be making direct payments to the counties and municipalities the GPA has said that they're going to double its size and growth over the next eight years. Uh, it, you know, it, it seems like impossible that we would absorb that growth without some funding to be able to mitigate the impacts to residents. I'm specifically thinking about congestion on our roads, the damage to the roads, and of course, pollution and the ultimate health, uh, health outcomes that come with that. Uh, what do you envision changing the relationship with the port for House District 163? I think to answer that question, I think, yes, absolutely. If we're going to double the size of our port, we definitely have to look at a way that we can provide a local government with an opportunity because, again, the ports are going to demand 
uh, services from local government. And that is going to be in the road of as that grows, it's going to bring uh, additional persons into the community, into the county. We're going to have more trucks on the road. We're going to have uh, more of our infrastructure needs being deteriorate, deteriorated and we got to look at how to replenish and replace that. I think we can have a conversation to look at how to uh, levy uh, a royalty fee, container fee, uh, some something that along those lines. But I think it's also going to be required of local government to tell us how they're going to use the funds too at the same time. I don't think we can create a, a fee that just goes into the operational account and government just gets to decide that uh, if the legislation were to be given to them that, well, guess what? We want to build a bigger arena with the money we're getting in from the Georgia Board of <laughs> now. Um, I think we got to have some rules and some guidance on how they use those funds. And one of the things that I'd like to say is I'd like to see uh, not only on infrastructure, but I'd like to also see how we can use uh, some of those funds in our own local education system as well, right? Uh, so not necessarily increasing the millage rate of property owners, but how can we leverage our expanding port authority uh, to leverage that for our local education system? And that may help us create some more uh, funding for some of those opportunity needs that I talked about earlier. I think you make some really fascinating points right there, Derek. Um, I'm not sure I would be in favor of, of too much strings on the money, but I, I sure agree when you say, you know, if they're going to turn around and take money from the Port Authority and build a bigger arena, but that's hard to disagree with that. Uh, so I do, I really, really appreciate uh, those answers. Chatham County is one of about a dozen counties in Georgia that I would call what is a, a net producer to the state budget. And, and when you really think about the regional five state area uh, that the port of Savannah supports, all of the jobs in Atlanta that use the port here, uh, you know, Chatham County probably sends upwards of $10 to the state budget for every dollar we receive in benefits. Do you think that there's a correlation there to the poverty rate here, you know, and then do you think, you know, doing some of these things like port container fees, local impact fees on new construction would maybe get the local governments the revenue needed. Uh, another point that I found interesting is that Chatham County has amongst the highest rates of non-taxable property amongst counties in the state of Georgia. You think about, you know, all of the Savannah College of Art and Design buildings, but it's not just them. We have amongst the highest churches per capita in Chatham County. Uh, we also have a large military base in the middle of the county in Hunter Army Airfield that does not pay property taxes as well. So given all of those dynamics, what can you do to change that ratio? And again, do you think that ratio is correlated to the historic poverty in Chatham County? Um, I, I think that correlation as we look at buildings who um, are owned that aren't necessarily paying property taxes, um, I think we have to look at that and maybe look at some sort of a usage or impact fee associated with that, but not like the disastrous fire fee that came out that was a blunder because we have to look at how those entities use essential services and receive services but don't necessarily pay for those services, so to speak. Uh, and the best way I can describe that is maybe um, is it a subscriber type funded type of, of situation where you have to kind of subscribe for some services? Um, because I know that there is an overwhelming amount of property that does not pay property tax. I mean, my church is definitely located in downtown Savannah, but I think we also have to look at the economic uh, impact that those entities may have, because if you say we're going to pay for an impact fee, but what is that economic impact that that institution may have? I know people reference SCAD. Um, but what is their economic impact on Savannah? What does that look like? I think we have to get everybody to the table and be realistic about that. I don't think we should come out and be too uh, heavy handed to say that we're going to uh, create impact fees for SCAD because if SCAD decides to say, well, we'll sell our property and move elsewhere, what does that do for our economy? Now, I'm not saying that they said that, that I'm just throwing out speculations in theory, um, but I think we have to look at some sort of a usage fee. But I think if we go and have a conversation uh, we don't know how the conversation may go because we haven't had that conversation, or at least I'm not aware that we've had those conversations. So we definitely need to look at what those fees could look like and how we can levy them and use them 
um, to increase revenue for municipalities. Um, as it relates to Hunter Army Airfield, um, that military base is, I think, a, a lifeblood for our economy. The soldiers who live on that base, thank them for their service. I thank them for their service, but they also provide uh, their own services on the base, uh, so to speak. And so now we're asking the federal government to potentially pay property tax as well in a downturn of the economy where base closures could be imminent. Um, I, I don't think that's something we should consider because I consider the, the lifeblood of the soldiers on Hunter Army Airfield and their families uh, a part of the economic engine that drives Savannah with off base housing and all the other things that they spend, shop and buy here. I think we should be careful in how we look at that and frame that. I think that's a perfectly valid uh, point on, on the issue. I don't think I was suggesting they should pay property taxes. I think I'm just suggesting that there's a lot of property in Chatham County that does not pay property taxes. The Ports Authority doesn't pay, the churches don't pay, the, the schools don't pay, Georgia Southern, Savannah State and SCAD. You know, and I just think in relation to an average suburban or urban county, there's there's likely more property than, say, normally might be uh, non-taxable, you know, in a, in a typical county our size or our population size. I think that's a challenge for us. Uh, I do want to I do want to move on. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about the home rule. Um, you know, last year's city elections were you know, very explosive, very historic. Every incumbent except for Dr. Shabazz was returned or was defeated rather. Um, what, what's your takeaway from the city elections? And, you know, where do you think, you know, politics in the state of Chatham are headed uh, in this year of 2020? I think uh, the results of the last election told us that uh, the city wanted people who were going to challenge the status quo. I think they wanted people who would be an advocate for them. I think uh, that election told us that they want somebody who's gonna fight for them. I think that election told us that they want someone who will be compassionate and understand what they need and instead of telling them what they should have. And I think all those who were elected uh, work diligently and hard and they campaign on, I will be here for you, I will be transparent. You are electing me as a community organizer, community activist, because I've been in your community. I, I know you, you know me, and you can hold me accountable. And I think that word accountability is one of the single greatest determining factors in that election because they knew they were electing people that they could hold accountable. Uh, and we see that they're working hard for us and um, they're trying to advocate and ask the right questions and ask questions. And I think in government, we have to ask questions. We just can't go along and get along. We do have to ask questions. A follow-up question here, Derek. Almost every candidate for council ran on term limits for city aldermen. We have uh, interviewed 12 candidates, I think, or 14 candidates maybe running for county commission so far this year. Uh, almost universally, with the exception of a few, uh, supported some version of term limits for county commissioners and city aldermen. Uh, the city council has placed this issue on their legislative agenda that they adopted for this year. Uh, will you will you begin the process of updating the charters to support term limits for those two bodies of government? So, and, and that that's a good question about supporting term limits. And I, I definitely think that uh, you have to uh, invest a significant amount of time. And then I also think you have to get out of the way and allow some change to take place. But when it comes down to specific term limits and what those term limits look like, and I'm not familiar if this would be uh, allowed to be put on a referendum type of ballot to allow the uh, citizens and the voters to vote on that. But that, that's the problem. I don't think government should vote on what their terms should be. I think if we craft it, we should listen to the people and let them decide what they think their terms in government should be and allow them to vote on what those terms should be. If government can vote on it, then uh, of course I'm gonna vote in the best interest of what I wanna see take place because I'm in government or I am a candidate and this is what's in favor of me. Uh, things that you allow voters to vote on will tell a telltale story, just like we asked the voters to vote on SPLOS and an overwhelming amount voted yes, but then there was a significant portion that voted no. Um, I think that should be put to the majority of voters to let them decide on what that should look like. We have to stop taking the voters out of the, the process of government. Uh, they should be included and they should decide what that should be. There should be some community-wide meetings and uh, some initiatives put in place where people can decide what that looks like. Uh, I support it. I, I don't have any problem with that. Um, I don't have any problem with somebody looking at what that term should be, but I also think 
uh, if someone's doing a great job representing you as well, what does that look like? And, and how does that term process work? Is it a, you know, you, you rest for uh, two terms and then you can rerun again. We just need to look at that and let the voters decide. Gotcha. Thank you. I want to talk about the most pressing issue in the state legislature for the Democratic Party, and that's Medicaid expansion. The COVID-19 pandemic is disproportionately affecting districts like yours, Derek. Black Georgians are more likely to contract and or pass away from this virus. And we're also, they're also facing layoffs and furloughs uh, in industries, especially here in House District 163. Immediate Medicaid expansion uh, would likely save lives that uh, might not necessarily need to be lost. Uh, if we didn't, how can you get the legislature and more importantly, a Republican governor on board with expanding Medicaid? So when you talk about expanding Medicaid, in order to get a Republican governor or a Republican legislature on board, we have to show how this is going to help us save money um, and talking about what this will do to help us in the long term of providing health care for uh, disproportionate communities, especially the African American community. Absolutely. We know that African Americans have uh, underlying health conditions that make COVID-19 more deadlier to them. And we know that's because healthcare has not been readily accessible in Black communities. Uh, we know that there are many other disparities in the forms of treatment that have taken place with how even African American Black patients are treated by physicians. So we need to look at how we can adequately expand Medicaid, but also show that if we do expand this Medicaid, uh, the outcome or the economic outcome from doing this will be uh, whatever that amount is. And I think we have to research that and put the numbers behind it because there is a side of the fence that will tell us uh, with Medicaid expansion what those numbers would look like, uh, especially in the African-American community if we had access to quality uh, health care. Absolutely. Thank you. The last, last few questions here for you, Derek. You know, obviously everything points to uh, where the budget will be for the state assembly. Uh, they're gonna reconvene shortly after the primary in June and try to pass a budget uh, for the fiscal year starting July 1st. They're, they're cutting it close this year, obviously, because of the pandemic. You know, Georgia has a constitutional amendment banning the legislature from raising income taxes uh, beyond 6%. Do you support changing or overturning that amendment, getting it back to the voters because of this crisis uh, so that you could potentially raise more revenue? And if not, where else are you going to find new revenue from at the state level? Well, absolutely. Um, I'm necessarily not looking to raise the income tax level, uh, because if you raise the income tax level, you're in a Republican legislature. Uh, so if you raise the income tax level and you say we're going to try to tax the most wealthiest, they're going to try to figure out a way to pass that to the backs of the most poor. Uh, point blank, plain and simple. And I'm telling you right now, poor people can't afford any more cuts because they are already cut, cut, cut. OK, so if there was a, a thin line, they're already on it. OK, so we can't afford that. But what we can do is the state of Georgia is one of few states. The Government Accounting Standards Board has asked for uh, each government to be transparent in the tax credits and abatements they give out. Now, the state of Georgia is uh, one of very few states where they don't provide that information. So when I get to the Georgia legislature, the question we need to be working on asking is who gets these tax abatements and these tax subsidies? Who gets all this tax assistance in the state of Georgia? The state is saying we can't provide that information because it violates uh, the income tax rule. So no, 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 no. Federal government says we should provide this information. I think we have an absorbent amount of corporations and companies that are getting corporate welfare in the state of Georgia. We don't have to tax individuals. We just need to immediately cease and desist all tax credits until we can get a budget crisis underneath us. Uh, we can't continue to pay out tax subsidies to companies who are not going to pay their fair share in taxes with the corporate income tax rate that we have that's one of the lowest. So we have a low corporate tax income rate and you're going to get tax allotments and subsidies and abatements. Whoa, 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 whoa. We got to stop this. We got to look at this and put an immediate pause, an immediate cease and desist on that, a moratorium, uh, if I could be more politically correct, on uh, tax abatements and tax incentives to co corporations that we're paying out. Uh, we don't need to tax the backs of individuals. We need to look at the corporations who are receiving the corporate welfare uh, and go back and say, it's time for all companies operating in the state of Georgia to pay their fair share. Uh, we can no longer put this on the backs of the working class people and say, hey, we got to tax you again because we need to make this happen. We can no longer do that. That, that ideology is not working. I think you make some very good points about corporate welfare. Uh, that GAO report uh, about Georgia's practice with incentives uh, is very disturbing. It's one of the few states. Uh, I do, I do want to push back though. You know, do, do you think 
the House District 163 resident that's making 26000 a year should pay the same 6%, you know, as Matt Ryan of the Falcons making $25 million a year, or I hope he's not making that much these days, but making millions a year. Do you think that those two taxpayers should pay the same tax rate? And so when you start looking at uh, uh, individuals on the class or the scope into uh, prospective uh, tax bracket, so to speak, we position ourselves to be kind of like the federal government, where uh, I think if you were to change that tax bracket where it wasn't the flat 6% that everybody paid and you moved it to more of an income driven tax bracket, I, I think what you're gonna have is, I think you're gonna shrink your middle class because I think the heaviest way to taxes is gonna be levied on those because we know the top 1% are always gonna find all the loopholes that they can get out of paying that income tax. And so uh, what's that gonna look like? Well, will they donate more to charity? Will they put it more in uh, sheltered uh, family trust? And so uh, who's then gonna pay that tax if they don't have to pay it and they have far better, smarter accountants and people who know the tax law better than you and I to help them get out of paying that income tax. Then that falls right back on that group. That's the middle class. And then we're going to go back to taxing them to death. And then we're going to shrink that group. And then that's going to be the group that's now in poverty. So we're going to expand our poverty pool. I think we should focus instead of looking at changing our uh, income tax rate to looking at how we can tax and uh, incentivize our corporations. I think taxing corporations is the way that we should go. Uh, and then we can find a path forward as it relates to the income tax. Thank you. I really appreciate those responses. Um, you, you've given some fascinating counterpoints to some of our questions, uh, things that we weren't really considering when we were asking them. So I really appreciate that. I really appreciate you sitting down uh, to, uh, to interview with us today. I know that it's really tough campaigning and working uh, with the coronavirus crisis. Uh, I do want to just give some housekeeping updates to the viewers on our page. Uh, we will have, I believe, our last interview for House District 163 in a little over an hour uh, with Matthew Swanson. Um, we've interviewed four out of the five candidates in this race now. We do expect that this race will uh, likely go to a runoff, so we certainly wish you the best of luck, Derek, and hope that you will be back uh, here with us in the runoff. Uh, next weekend, or actually first, tomorrow afternoon, we'll be having a debate for the first district county commission seat in the Democratic primary. And then next Saturday, we'll have two large events for the two main countywide races, uh, one at 1.30 p.m. Uh, for the Democratic primary for the district attorney's race, and one at 5.30 p.m. Uh, for a special two-hour debate for the Democratic primary for the chairman's race, uh, the chairman of the county commission. Uh, so I just want to update everybody on that. Derek, take a couple of uh, seconds here. I mean, more than seconds. Take a minute or two here to uh, tell people, again, how to get in touch with you, how to find out more about your campaign. Uh, we really appreciate you sitting down. Feel free to share some of your conclusion thoughts uh, based on, on, on the topics in this interview as well. Go ahead. Well, first and foremost, as I stated in the beginning of the interview, uh, thank you to Better Savannah, the entire team at Better Savannah for uh, inviting me to have this conversation with you, Chuck, and uh, for those who uh, labor in both time and resources to put this together, we're grateful for that opportunity. Uh, if you want to connect with me, you can simply find me on Facebook, uh, Derek for Georgia House District 163 on Facebook. Uh, you can reach me on my, my cell. You can reach me at 912-785-3193. It rings to my phone, or you can email me at Derek uh, at DerekForGeorgia.com, or you can reach us at DerekForGeorgia at gmail.com. Uh, I, I check both emails daily and regularly, uh, or you can stop me on the street. I worship at First Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church. I'm uh, active in a shop and eat in the district. You can find me, uh, and if you see me in the street, you can stop me and ask me a question. Uh, I'm not too big and I'm, I'm not too small where I won't talk to any and everybody. And if a rock will listen, I'll talk to it too. So you can reach me in any of those platforms. I'm accessible. Uh, you can call me and text me. Uh, and if I don't answer your call, I'm going to get back to you. I might be talking to somebody else. So I tell everybody, charge it to my head and not my heart, because I want to connect with everybody and do all that we can. And you can visit the website. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. What's your website again? Uh, www.derek4 Georgia, uh, four in Georgia are spelled out.com. You can go to our website, learn more about me, and you can reach out to me there as well. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you for sitting down uh, with us to interview. I really appreciated your responses to our questions. Please stay safe on the campaign trail. Obviously, 
you know, as things reopen, uh, people at home that are watching, please wash your hands and, uh, you know, uh, maybe not listen to the Republican governor uh, just yet. But with that being said, we appreciate you guys tuning in uh, for this broadcast this afternoon. We'll be back in just over an hour. All right.